Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ann Harrison. I'm the Dean of the Haas School of Business. I'd like to welcome you all to our final Dean Speaker Series of the spring semester. It has been such an honor and so much fun to introduce so many distinguished leaders as part of this series. And I really hope you continue to take advantage of this series. I certainly have learned a lot, and I hope you have too. And now today, it is my privilege to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Marty Chavez. Marty is a partner and vice chairman of Sixth Street, a leading global investment firm dedicated to developing themes and offering solutions to companies across all stages of growth. He formerly served in the roles of both CFO and CIO for Goldman Sachs. Marty is widely renowned as a trailblazer and leader who turned the Wall Street trading business into a software business by using data, math, software, and machine learning to solve hard problems for clients and stakeholders. Um, prior to joining Goldman Sachs, Marty was the CEO and co-founder of Kyodex and chief technology officer and co-founder of Quorum Software Systems. Uh, he has many degrees from very fancy universities, including a PhD, so we could call him Dr. Marty, but I guess we won't do that today. Um, beyond finance, Marty has long held a passion for converging the life sciences and software with an eye for new applications of AI and technology that will ultimately transform industries. He served as an advisor and board member to multiple startups and projects that are accelerating breakthroughs. He is currently on the board of directors of Alphabet, and he shared with us in the green room that they have a board meeting this afternoon, so we won't keep him too long. Um, he also serves on numerous fiduciary and advisory boards, including Abagus AI, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and the Stanford Center on Longevity. I neglected to mention that I think his PhD is from that school that shall not be named. <laughs> um, Marty, it is clear that you are very busy, so thank you so much for taking the time to come speak to us today. You are a leader of distinction on so many fronts, and I know that you will cover that in more depth in today's talk, which, by the way, is also co-sponsored by the Berkeley Culture Center. So now I'll turn it over to our moderators, who are our MBA students, Elsa Morgan and Ryan Tan. We just want to reiterate what a delight it is to have you here, uh, Marty. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself, and then Ryan will do the same. We'll jump right into the questions. Great. So uh, as Dean Harrison said, I am a full-time MBA student. I'm in my second year, about to graduate, three more weeks left of classes, tier. Um, here at Haas, I have been involved with the Latinx Business Club. I'm a fellow Latina, and I have been involved with uh, Media and Entertainment Club. Passing it down to you, Ryan. Thank you, Elsie. Um, my name's Ryan. I'm a second year MBA student here as well. Um, I help lead the Haas Investment Club and diversity, equity, inclusion is a very big part of our mission here at Haas. So it's very excited to have you here. Um, so before I pass it back over to Elsie um, to kick off our meeting, let's all give uh, Marty a warm welcome round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Absolutely delighted to be here, and thank you, Dean, for that extremely kind introduction. Great. Without further ado, uh, we want to start at the beginning. Okay. Why, don't, why don't you tell us a little bit more about um, your childhood? We understand you're from New Mexico. I am. You came from a big family. Big enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, the oldest of five. Five children, yeah. that's right. Um, and as Dean Harrison said, you went to fancy schools, the first one being Harvard. Yep. Uh, can you tell us, um, and I believe your siblings also went to Harvard. So we have a, a, a little bit of minor notoriety. All five of us went to Harvard. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, so that leads to my first question. People always ask about how my mom did it, and we can talk about that if you want. <laughs> um, that is actually my first question. Go for it. How did your parents instill such a a strong desire for education? So um, I'm, I'm Hispanic, Latino like you, and I'm uh, a bit of a mutt. So 
Uh, my uh, one of my grandmothers was a Spanish Civil War refugee. She was Basque. Uh, one of my uh, grandfathers was from Jalisco. He came across in the early 1900s to work on the railroad. And my on my dad's side, um, there's some very interesting, colorful Spanish Jews who've been in New Mexico since the late 1500s and never went anywhere else. Uh, my mom grew up in the barrio in Albuquerque and in really rough circumstances. And for reasons that nobody understands, uh, apparently when she was 10, she made a, a vow, uh, what financiers would call a binary option. Either she was going to be a nun or she was going to have 10 children and send them all to Harvard. <laughs> How... How she got the idea of Harvard, really nobody can explain. Um, but I th she'd heard of it, and she thought it was a good school, and why not? And so we were organized like a startup. The goal is all five kids go to Harvard. So what do we have to do today to make that more likely? And what do we have to not do to make it less likely? And that was how it was organized. And so we had three uh, priorities, my mom did anyway, um, which were uh, music, education, and religion. Um, she uh, did really well on the first two and failed catastrophically on the third. And she's still hard on herself about that. Uh, but uh, music and education were always the, the priorities. When I was a kid, uh, I had a moment Many of you might have seen the movie The Graduate. I know I'm really dating myself, but there's a famous scene where uh, someone puts his arm around the young guy's uh, shoulders and said, plastics, right? Plastics is the future. Well, my dad did that for me when I was 10 in 1974, except he said, computers. And it wasn't as obvious then as it is now, but he said, you'll be really good at computers. And for me, it was the only freedom that I got in that, in that environment we were growing up in. Like everything was very strictly prioritized. But if I wanted to go to the University of New Mexico and teach myself computer programming, I could do that all weekend long. That was a safe place. And so I associated programming with freedom. And so uh, by the time I was 15 and already spent, you know, probably tens of thousands of hours writing programs. Um, in New Mexico, you kind of got two choices. You can work on tourism or the military industrial complex. And so I went for the military industrial complex where my parents both worked. And my very first job, um, I think, was really a harbinger of my whole career, which was the Department of Defense had decided that it was really bad to blow up neutron bombs in the Nevada desert. It was upsetting people and making them sick. And someone got the idea, could we simulate blowing up bombs and do it all on a supercomputer and not blow up the bombs at all? And this was a crazy idea. And I just kind of showed up. And that was my very first project, was writing a computer program that simulated the scattering of Compton electrons from neutron bombs. I was about 15. And that idea of building a digital twin of a business or scientific or industrial process was something I got a very early exposure to. And I've been doing variations of that my whole life. Wow. Yeah, at 15. Strange. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm grateful for Albuquerque. It's a... It's, you know, most people say uh, they remember it from Bugs Bunny, but uh, I remember it in this other, other way as a place where my family had been for hundreds of years and uh, really one of the pioneering places in, well, for instance, Los Alamos Labs in, in atomic physics and then also in, in supercomputing. A couple of other interesting computer geeks strangely got their early start in Albuquerque of all places. Famously, Jeff Bezos and also Bill Gates. Yeah. That's a very fascinating start yeah. to your life. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to jump forward in time. Please. And um, 
talk a little bit about your time um, in Wall Street. Mm. You were one of the first openly gay and Latino executives, um, and you urged Goldman Sachs um, to expand benefits to gay partners before the Supreme Court had even legalized marriage, uh, legalized gay marriage. Um, did you feel a pressure and a responsibility in being in the position that you were in to advocate for these uh, propositions? Well, to back up just a little bit, how did I get there? So as, as Udine mentioned, I went to that other school down the peninsula, and I was working on uh, artificial intelligence, and it was the late 80s, and our aspirations were so far ahead of what we could actually do it was one of the many nuclear winters of AI that we uh, we would kind of say AI, we'd whisper it, like maybe we shouldn't even say the word because it was kind of a joke what we were doing compared to what we wanted to do. The compute power was way too too low. Um, I was with a really interesting group of, of people. Um, uh, one of them is the chief scientist of Microsoft, uh, Eric Horvitz. We worked on projects together. David Hackerman, similar role at Amazon, uh, one's me. The fourth is by far the most successful. Uh, he decided to uh, that medicine is too hard. Let's apply AI to an easier problem. Uh, which movie to watch tonight? So that, of course, is our, our friend Reed Hastings, who started Netflix. So it was a real, uh, it was a fascinating place to be. Uh, many, of, many of them stuck with AI. In the middle of that, I didn't know what to do. AI wasn't working that great. And randomly, I got a letter. And the letter said, a prestigious New York investment bank, which <clears throat> I had maybe heard of but knew nothing about, called Goldman Sachs, um, has asked me, the headhunter, <clears throat> to make a list of entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley with PhDs from Stanford in math or computer science. And you're on my list. Would you please come out for an interview? I took this as a joke. I thought I was scamming this bank for a free trip to New York to hang out with my college buddies and have fun. And, and the punish, the tax would be I'd have to go and talk to them on the Monday. So I show up on Monday, and they ask me if I want a math quiz or a computer science quiz. And I was pretty indifferent, because to me it was kind of a joke. And I said I would take both. And they were very excited by that, <laughs> because most people uh, really wanted just one but not the other. And I you know, could, was interested in both, which is what they were looking for. I didn't know that. They wanted people who could do the math and also render it into, into software, as opposed to separate groups of people. Mm -hmm. And they had this ambition to build a digital twin of the trading business. And so in spite of myself, I thought, well, I'm really into digital twins. Like, that's kind of what I do. So I got a little bit more interested. They put an offer in front of me, which is a little bit weird for Goldman. It usually takes, I don't know, 52 interviews is the average or something like that. But they were in a big rush to get this project done. And I was from Silicon Valley, and I just wanted to get out and get back. And so they put the offer in front of me, and I stared at it. And it was multiples of any number I'd ever seen. And, and so suddenly, it wasn't a joke anymore. <laughs> and I was very silent. And the gentleman who was hiring me was getting nervous, because I wasn't saying anything at all. And after a very long and comfortable pause, I said, and this is 1993, I think I should tell you that I'm gay. And this, you know, now, so, oh, so you know, who cares? But then, this was something that had not happened. And he didn't know what to do. And so he said a very, well, something that you wouldn't say with current rules, but I thought it was lovely. He said, do you have a boyfriend? And I said, well, I do. What does he do? He's a securities attorney. Oh, what's he doing in San Francisco? We'll get him a job with the firm that does our legal work here, and you can come out together. And I thought, wow, this is a gay-friendly firm. Not, 
not not what I'd heard, right? And I wasn't about to go back into the closet just for some job. These are the days of Queer Nation in San Francisco, and my my I was in a startup, and my colleagues would say, "Be be sure to wear your Queer Nation T-shirt when we go pitch to VCs. They'll really find that quirky and interesting, right?" So I wasn't going to go back in the closet for some job in New York, and I thought, "Okay, they're gay friendly," so I said yes. I it wasn't exactly that they were gay friendly. I had maybe jumped the gun a little bit. Um, when I got to Goldman Sachs about six weeks later, I realized I was the only out gay person in the entire company globally. And there were like three out gay people on Wall Street, all of it. But it was gay and different. In other words, they just wanted me to write some software for the trading business. And if the software worked and led to better trades with more money and fewer losses, we were happy. And that was good enough for me. So I was always grateful for Goldman for not so much for supporting me, but for not caring. Mm. As for being Latino, which you know, to me in New Mexico, which is 75% Latino, uh, is pretty obvious, right? But uh, a strange thing happened on the Goldman trading desk. One day the boss comes up to me and he says, hey Marty, somebody told me that you speak Spanish. And I said, had you ever noticed my last name? And he said, all these years, I could have sworn you were Jewish. Anyway, I need you to go, as if you couldn't be both, um, I need you to go to Buenos Aires and talk to some clients uh, in Spanish. And that, so it turns out that speaking Spanish was a huge career advantage for me. I was by far the only quant who could speak Spanish. And so that turned out to be super helpful. As we roll forward, I did feel kind of part of my queer nation background, some desire, maybe even some duty to help organize other gay people. The first few years of that were not very promising. I remember I would email people. I vividly remember a response from someone I knew from the gay scene in New York who worked at Goldman. And he said, do not email me ever again. I cannot be seen to be receiving emails from you. Right? So that was kind of the prison that he was in. I just wasn't in that mental prison myself. And so over time, there were more gay people. Uh, we very much believed, come out, come out wherever you are. Uh, we did agitate for gay rights in various forms. Um, I remember the first time we talked about benefits for same-sex partners, I got 20 objections from legal about why we would not do that. And we just worked through the objections one at a time, and eventually it happened. As you keep rolling forward, I got more and more senior. And finally, it was time for the Supreme Court to consider striking down the Defense of Marriage Act. Lloyd Blankfein, who I grew up with, who was our CEO by then, but when I joined, he was just another trader. Um, he took this extraordinary leadership position on that topic. The first American CEO to do so. He took a lot of flack. A lot of people said, well, a lot of people didn't like it. And a lot of people said, it's all well and good, but what does it have to do with Goldman Sachs? Why are you doing this? Don't you have other things to do? And he took a lot of heat for that. I remember vividly thanking him. And he said, don't thank me. It was, of course, the right thing to do. But it was also the commercially smart thing to do. If my taking that stand makes you just a little bit happier to be here, then it's worth it. So I always loved that about Goldman and Lloyd in particular. Right? We were always looking to find the intersection between doing the right thing and doing the smart thing. And we found there was a strong Venn diagram there. That's lovely. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Sure. I really like that story. Um, so we're going to jump over to maybe some um, times more uh, as a finance professional during crises. Oof. So this might be... That's where the gray hair came from. Yes. 
So you were at Goldman during the global financial crisis. Yes. And you saw firsthand the market imploding. So Bear, Lehman, and Merrill are all gone, mm -hmm. and Morgan and Goldman are not too far behind. That was right. So how did you feel at the time, and what was going through your <laughs> mind when you saw all of this unfold? Well, I mean, all kinds of feelings. So first, watching all my stored wealth in the form of restricted stock heading towards zero was... Uh, uncomfortable and really put me in touch with the impermanence of all things. Um, another thing I remember very vividly, uh, the Saturday before Lehman failed, my boss calling me up. I was out on Fire Island, and this is Saturday afternoon. He says, Marty, um, can, you, can you come back to the city? And I said, oh, there's a ferry at 3 o'clock, and I can be at the office by 5 o'clock. And he said, can you take a helicopter? And I thought, whoa, this isn't a regular Saturday at all. And I got to the office, and the first thing I remember, I was always an agitator for a relaxed dress code. I hated, to, to me, how I wore a coat and tie for 25 years is beyond me. Um, but that day, nobody was asking about the dress code. So it was like Goldman at the beach. We didn't even call people. and. Everybody came to the office because we knew things were getting really bad. But people were wearing flip-flops and tank tops, and I thought, we should do this all the time. Uh, and, uh, and we just basically lived there. And I remember getting a specific assignment, my boss saying, we are specifically having liquidity outflows in this particular business. And I'd always thought of this business as being very, very far away from my expertise as a derivatives quant. And he said, go figure out what's going on in that business. Go run that business. And I said, I don't really know anything about that business. And he said, this was an incredible opportunity for learning and personal growth. And I did not feel that way at the time, right? I felt like this could be career ending. And so I had some internal panic, like how am I going to succeed here? I, I literally don't know anything about the business. But that's what the business needed. It needed an outsider who hadn't grown up in the business to step way back and say, I want to know where every dollar is at every moment in its journey and where it might go and under what circumstances and then model the whole thing in software, build a digital twin, which is really my only trick. And so I just keep repeating that trick. So that's how I got through the financial crisis. And after that, I got some battlefield promotions and... Uh, and yeah, so there was a there was a silver lining for me, uh, but it was a it was a it was a rough time. I you know, much much rougher for a lot of people than it was for for me, right? Um, but I remember later on experiencing something I did not res expect at all. Uh, I remember it was a couple years later, and I was out here with my family having Thanksgiving, and a distant stepfather of a relative is sitting next to me. And he, he sits down and he says, how do you look at yourself in the mirror? And I said, excuse me? And he said, well, well, you guys caused the financial crisis. And uh, I was angry because that's false. And then I thought, OK. I'm listening, tell me exactly how we caused the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, well, Lehman. And I said, that was a different bank, <laughs> right? And then he said, well, well, AIG, that's an insurance company, right? And so the point is that there was just in the, in the world of public relations yeah. and reputation, there was some strange dynamic that we had done our jobs as risk managers mm -hmm. 
and suffered a lot less than other banks. So somehow, weirdly, we must have been responsible for it. And that was probably one of the roughest lessons that I've ever learned, which is irrespective of what you say or do, what could people think or say about what you say or do, which we now understand is reputational risk and the, the hardest risk management of all. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, on a follow-up, so there's been a recent spate of bank failures with Silicon Valley Bank. I noticed. Um, and so one of the questions we have is, is this something we should be worried about compared to 08, 09? And do you think the spread, uh, do you think the markets will eventually calm down given the recent actions by the large Wall Street banks and the regulators? I don't know. I had significant PTSD uh, when Silicon Valley Bank failed. Um, you can imagine the number of emails and phone calls I got from my siblings, from startup entrepreneurs, from investors, um, what to do. I remember um, since I was in LA, it was Oscars weekend. That actually grounded me. I looked around at the Oscar celebration and I realized these people just don't care at all. This, this is happening in a different planet as far as they're concerned, right? And so strangely, that was, that was helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I am concerned that a trillion dollars of deposits have moved out of banks mm -hmm. and into other places, principally money market funds, where they principally just sit at the Federal Reserve, which I completely get. Um, it's complicated if you're a bank. It depends on that funding. I ask myself if the nexus of social media and rapid digital funds transfers mean that we really got to rethink the traditional commercial banking model, which is funding with deposits, which are site deposits, which can go at any moment, except they usually don't, but then they do. Right, and then on the other end, you're lending it out for 30 years, right? So this is always this, you know, po the the polite term is maturity transformation, but it's complicated, right? It depends on confidence, and I do not know what other measures will be necessary to restore confidence. Um, I will note that this is very different from 2008. Uh, history is not repeating. Um, it is rhyming in some ways that are that are disconcerting. Um, I do wonder if deposit insurance will need to be expanded and how that will work, or if we will find another way another way through it. We're not done. There's a bunch of actions that still need to be taken. Will there be? Other tremors in other parts of the financial system? Probably, right? But that's just looking at history. When rates have been zero, especially when they've been zero for as long as they have been, and then they move up, something always breaks. Actually, multiple things break. And a bunch of things have broken, right? Biotech, crypto, uh, some of the really extreme crypto experiments and algorithmic stable coins, um, right, those, those, I mean, I've, I've been out there saying for years, um, stable is to stable coin is democratic is to democratic Republic of the Congo, right? They're not, the, the word stable is there to distract you from the instability, right? So those things have broken. Silicon Valley Bank broke. Um, so did some other banks. Is that enough breakage? I don't know. Uh, commercial real estate is certainly getting a lot of dis discussion. There's a lot of refinancing that needs to happen. There are developers who are walking away from their buildings and foreclosures are happening. Um, one thing that Goldman taught me is uh, we don't predict the future because we can't. Anyone who's predicting the future is a charlatan. And on the other hand, you can be great predictors of the present. You can have a really deep model of what is going on right now, and then you can inspect that model 
and maybe you'll find other things that can go wrong in the future, but fundamentally nobody knows. Thank you. Sure. So we just talked a little bit about what transpired with SVB and maturity transformation and the yeah. lack of confidence and social media uh, sort of fanning and the And lack flames. of interest rate hedging and a bunch of things. And a yes. lot of other things. Yes. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on regulation? Is there, mm. do you want to? Yeah, I am, I am regulatory friendly in a massive way. I'm an, I'm an outlier there, right? And that... I um, see the appropriate amount of regulation as essential, and I've always been willing to do the work to establish a rapport with the regulators who have an extremely hard job and teach them what they need to know about how a business works when I do know how that business works. and and do it in as neutral a way as possible without talking my own book, which everybody is going to have some temptation to do. So establish credibility and find solutions. I um, did a lot of that at Goldman. I remember vividly the day my boss said, um, so the Dodd-Frank Act has been passed. Now the regulators are writing the rules, and then we'll implement the rules, and you own the rule writing and implementation of Dodd-Frank for, for the firm. And he added with a smile, and remember, we don't pay extra for that. And then I knew that was my job, and I was going to be on the Acela every Monday for a really long time. So um, I think the regulators who implemented the Dodd-Frank Act need to, to get major acknowledgement for what worked. So during the pandemic, and again recently, what you did not notice was any kind of panic relating to the global systemically important banks. And why is that? That is because the regulations require those banks to hold so much capital and so much liquidity and to run a digital twin, a stress test, where they simulate themselves for nine quarters in the future and demonstrate their soundness, their ability to continue lending and making markets, even in a stress scenario, that stuff worked brilliantly. And so I'm a big fan of the right amount of regulation. I also happen to think, personal opinion, that a lot of what was in Dodd-Frank was a complete, was just red tape that did not make the system safer and sounder, but that doesn't detract from the critically important parts of it and capital and liquid liquidity ad uh, adequacy that were game changing for the financial system. I think the rollback of parts of the Dodd-Frank Act for smaller banks in 2018 was a, was a huge mistake. Was it the cause of what we've seen recently? Hard to demonstrate causality, but personal opinion, a big mistake. And so when I say there's more work to do, this is some of the work, right? What are the regulations that we do that we do want? Um, one thing in Dodd-Frank and, and the Basel regulations did not work, right? It was supposed to end too big to fail. There were supposed to be playbooks for what happens when a bank is in trouble. Uh, but for instance, when Credit Suisse got in trouble, nobody even opened the playbook. Now these playbooks are tens of thousands of pages long. So you could ask, why do we do all that work if nobody even looked at it when a crisis actually happens? And I think one of the realizations is that, that no man is an island, everything is interconnected, all the banks are interconnected. When people lose some confidence in one bank, there is an effect on other banks. The only question is, um, is what is that effect gonna be? Thank you. Um, so turning over DEI, so at Haas we care greatly about DEI. Do you think Wall Street has gotten better in recent years in promoting DEI and supporting the careers of underrepresented demographics? What can Wall Street do better? We've, we've gotten better for sure. But there's one 
one statistic, I'm a numbers person, right? So there's one area where where it's clear we're, we've gotten better, but we have a long ways to go. And so here's just one stat. You look at the demographics in which you operate. So I'm just going to make up some percentages here that might be roughly right. So for New York, New Jersey, well, this one's obvious. Half the people are women. Another one is 14% of the people self-identify as Hispanic or Latin. 9% self-identify as black or African descent, right? 4% self-identify as LGBT. If you look at the junior levels of any Wall Street firm, or if you look at the assistants, you'll see the demographics roughly reflecting the regions in which those firms operate. Same is true of Silicon Valley, for instance. And then as you go up the ranks, let's look at the same percentages for associates, vice presidents, managing directors, partners. It gets more and more sparse. I remember one time years ago, I was having a meeting in New York Plaza with Alejandro, one of the, one of the partners in our trading business. And a third partner sees us in the glass fishbowl. His name is Pablo. He walks by. He opens the door. He looks in. He says, 50% of the Hispanic partners of Goldman Sachs right here, right now. And then he closes the door and leaves, right? And I, I thought, wow, is that true? There's only six of us out of 400? Right, And so that's the kind of phenomenon that you really saw back then. This is maybe 15 years ago. It continues. Um, often, specifically when we were talking about women, you'll hear something that I, that I really hate hearing, which is, well, women step out because of childcare and childbearing. And it is true that women bear a wildly disproportionate share of childcare. It is not the reason there are fewer women at senior levels. And why is that? Because you see the exact same phenomenon for other diverse groups, Hispanic, black, all the diverse groups. And so something is happening is not going to be fixed automatically by the passage of time, right? So, so getting 50% of the analysts to be women, which most of, maybe not all of the banks have achieved, that is not by itself enough. It's a fantasy to say that, well, roll forward 20 years and half the women, half the partners will be women. That is not what we see. Instead, we see something much more subtle, which is, People from diverse backgrounds somehow opting out of or precipitating out of the system before they have enough time to reach the senior ranks. And it's usually something very subtle, but I'll, I'll, I'll just make up a little narrative here. So there's a trader who went to school and played hockey, and not surprising that the trader's a guy. And on the desk, there's a bunch of hockey players from the same school, right? They have a background of relatedness. People on the desk who are not hockey players sort of look at that group and say, oh, well, I'm not really in that group, am I? And that group has events. Maybe they go out and they say, well, we could invite that person, but I don't think she's going to be too interested in hanging out with a bunch of hockey players. And then maybe it comes time to give out client lists or trading books or risk parameters. And somehow the person who's not in, the, in this little group uh, gets a little bit less juicy in assignment, makes a little bit less money naturally. Then it comes time to pay in promotion doesn't get paid quite as much, doesn't get promoted quite as much. Over time, this kind of floats out of the system, right? And it's these subtle and significant biases. Many academics, Harvard and elsewhere, have done some amazing work on this topic. And we're not even aware of them. And we're subtly excluding people. And they're not feeling a part of it. And that's what's really going on. So how do we change that? Um, there's no substitute, it's work. 
I actually, in my firm, just came out of a, a morning at our office in San Francisco where we brought all of our partners together and we went through every diverse professional in the firm one at a time and we asked their managers and their mentors and their sponsors, what are you doing to support this person's career? Is this person on track for the next promotion? Is this person in the right job? Is there some kind of connectivity, some kind of stretch assignment, some kind of coaching? What should we be doing? And then did we actually do all those things that we said we were going to do? This kind of support really, I've seen it work and it makes a difference, uh, but it, it's not something that just happens by itself. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, now we're going to open up uh, the floor to audience Q&A. So if you have a question, uh, please go up to the mic and start by stating your name. You can ask me anything except, uh, except do not ask me about upcoming earnings announcements. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ethan, and I'm with the undergraduate program. First off, I wanted to thank you for all the stories you shared with us today. Really inspiring. Um, in particular, I was really inspired by the story of you doing so much pioneering in terms of um, setting culture. And so I had one question around that, and I was ma mainly interested in first understanding um, how you were able to motivate yourself to be a change maker of culture, especially given, I'm sure, a lot of professional setbacks and um, personal time investment into this. And then in addition to that, I was wondering, um, you've implemented a lot of very successful initiatives. I was just wondering how you were able to get so many people to buy in, especially when finance is very much seen from the outside as more so an industry that keeps the status quo and less so one that wants to push forward new change. So it was great questions, thank you. Um, I would attribute most smart things I do to good advice I got from mom. And so um, I'll just share some of it in, in no particular order. So uh, here's something my mom would say when we were growing up in Albuquerque, 75% Hispanic, but we were the underclass definitively. And my mom would say, you're Hispanic, boo-hoo, the Anglo-Saxon majority is not your problem. If we cared as much about education as we cared about cars and boyfriends and girlfriends, we would be in a different place. You have to work twice as hard to get half as far, so you'd better get busy. This is all I heard growing up. You know, terribly politically incorrect, but it is what I heard, and I deeply internalized it. And then when I realized I was gay, I thought, wow, I better work 10 times as hard. So I've always had that underdog mentality. But then there was some other advice from mom, uh, which I'll share in Spanish because uh, it's more vivid and it sounds better. Um, so in Spanish, you would ask the question, what will people say? What will people think? ¿Qué dirá la gente? And my mother's answer, which is crazy, but she would say, que digan misa si pueda, which means literally let them say mass if they can figure it out how to do that. But it means something a lot less polite. <laughs> and, uh, and so I always had that too, like you know what, there's going to be a lot of people who don't like what I'm going to do or say, and I don't care that much. I'm not actually here. I'm not here to be liked. The last bit of advice I got from mom, I remember sitting around the dinner table, and my brother, much more altruistically minded, said, I want to do something that helps Hispanics. And my mom said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> she said, if you really want to help Hispanics, be really successful and be really visible. And that's the way you can really help Hispanics if you're serious about it. And so I really, I really internalized that. And, you know, when... 
Uh, my baby sister graduated from Harvard, so that was five of us. And there's a professor, Harry Lewis, professor of computer science, my great mentor and friend. He said to me, man, there are a lot of you Chavezes coming through here. I've, I've lost count. How many? And I said, it's five. And he said, that's got to be some kind of record. Um, especially since you're, you know, you're not the the Kennedys of Hyannisport, you're the Chavez's of Albuquerque. Um, and so I want to do a little event. So I thought, okay, you can do a little event. They gave my parents a certificate for getting the kids through through Harvard and had a little ceremony. And a producer from New York, Matt Lauer from the Today Show, called and said, I would like to uh, get an emotional... I like to broadcast the Today Show from, you know, from Harvard, and I like to interview your family. And so there I am on the Today Show. I don't know how many people watch that thing, but a lot. And I'm sitting there with my mom and dad and all my brothers and sisters, and Matt asked me, he said, it sounds like you grew up in like a concentration camp. <laughs> what was it like? And, you know, this is awkward with mom and dad on either side and on national TV. And I said, you know, I, I might have thought it was rough, but now I realize no two people ever, ever did more for the kids. Well, what came out of that is unbelievable. To this day, my mom and dad, who really get all the credit, get, get mail all the time on LinkedIn, who knows how people get to them. And it's always some form of, I saw your family on Today Show, and I thought, I can do that too. And my family did that. And, you know, there's six of us, and we all went to Stanford, or there's eight of us, and we all went, you know, there's just a very large number of those stories, and and people actually attributed back to seeing that. So as with many things, it turns out mom was right. Thank you so much. You bet. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being here today. Uh, so I'm, my name is Arno. I'm a first-year MBA. Uh, my question is about uh, Sixth Street. Yeah. Uh, so I, I saw that um, the company recently took a stake in Any last year. Uh, so Any is an energy, uh, like energy leading company uh, that operates, among other, uh, gas power plants. So I wanted to to have your vision on such investments and if you could maybe share why you believe that remaining invested in oil and gas companies is a great way to keep pressure on them to yeah. change. Okay, it's great, great question. So we, we do all kinds of investing um, at Sixth Street. The usual question I get asked, especially I'm in Spain, is uh, when I'm in Spain is, um, wow, you guys invested in Real Madrid? And Football Club Barcelona, that's all anybody wants to talk about. And then recently, uh, a new Bay Area women's soccer team, which we're really excited about. Um, oil and gas. I grew up in the oil and gas business. It was my first trading desk at Goldman Commodities uh, Trading. And so I, I learned a lot about that business. Um, first of all, I have a strong view that the world is moving away from oil and gas Uh, that's just happening. And you know, some of you might remember the silliness that we were going to run out of oil and gas, right? That is nonsensical. If you just do some basic math, the earth has a lot of oil and gas in its crust, right? And we're going to stop using the oil and gas way before it runs out. And I'm really excited about that. On the other hand, it is not happening instantaneously. And, um, I remember, I remember, I was on the board of uh, of Harvard, and there would always be there would always be protesters. Like we'd be walking, you know, the overseers have to wear these top hats, so we really stand out. And and young people would come up and say, like, "You've got to divest oil and gas from the endowment right now." And being a precise, data-oriented kind of guy, I want to know what that means exactly in the context of an endowment, right? So in the context of an endowment, we're not actually picking stocks. We pick managers who might then pick stocks. And so, so being a part of the transition and setting goals for the transition is really, really important. We believe this at Sixth Street as well. 
And doing this transition in a responsible and rapid way is really important too. Um, I'll note, for instance, at Alphabet, there's an extremely ambitious energy transition plan that is really, as far as I've seen, the gold standard for, for a company on Alphabet scale, which is to have the entire company operating 24 by 7 exclusively on renewable energy. And when you think about all the data centers and all the AI pods and all that, that is a very, very big, um, very big commitment. And there's a million things that have to happen for the energy transition to work, right? It isn't just make the oil and gas go away and stop investing in it. We have to electrify the grid, um, something that I'm very excited about that we're working on at 6th Street. Um, I was just mentioning to the dean beforehand, Jennifer Doudna from Berkeley, Nobel Prize winner, discovered CRISPR gene editing. She's our chief science advisor. And something that we're very excited about, we see the big short-term applications for gene editing to be in, in, cli in mitigating climate change. The things that we're now able to do with crops are amazing, right? Crops that don't require rotation. Cows that don't, let's see, how can I say this politely, emit methane, right? That you can actually bioengineer the ruminants in the guts of cows, and they're huge contributors to uh, carbon in the atmosphere as well. So it's a very complicated picture and we're working on all of it and it's gonna happen. Is it gonna happen soon enough? I don't know. Are we all lit up with the urgency of it at 6th Street, at Alphabet, everywhere? Yes, and are we investing massive dollars in it? We're doing that as well. Thank you. You bet. Thank you for speaking to us today, Marty. Uh, my name is Austin. I'm a first year MBA, um, replacing Elsie as president of the Latinx Business Club and replacing Ryan as president of the Investment Management Club. Um, <laughs> Thanks. I'm heading to the retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think we share somewhat of a similar uh, childhood in that I grew up in both a Latin and Jewish home as well. And I've noticed for me when I've been in business rooms and in meetings, I've seen parts of myself, but never someone who truly was myself. And I'm curious, when you were earlier in your career, how you first found the confidence to tell yourself that you belonged without seeing yourself in the room, and then now later on, how you've helped other people see themselves and be confident in themselves. Yeah, so I, um, I know there's the concept of intersectionality, right? And you can have a bunch of identities, right? So I'm a, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a Catholic household with this historical awareness of our Jewishness. I remember for me a big moment, a, a fellow who worked for me was Eli Wiesel's son. And his family invited me to Shabbat, and they said this beautiful prayer. And I asked, you know, because I don't know Hebrew, I asked, what was that? And they said, it was for you. It was for the return of a lost member of the tribe, right? And I thought, okay, I guess, I guess I'm part of it. And, you know, I have friends who threatened to have a bar mitzvah for me. Um, and so you can have all these identities. Um, but then I'll just give you an anecdote, so I, this happened at Goldman. Someone said, Marty, it's great that you're Latin, gay, but until I see someone who's Asian and gay, I really won't believe that you can make it on Wall Street. And I, I really thought about that, and my response was a bit strong, and I hope it was the right one. I said, dude, if I'd been waiting for a Hispanic mentor, just Hispanic, I'd still be waiting. And if I'd been waiting for a gay partner ahead of me, I'd still be waiting. Susie Sher and I are the first two openly gay partners promoted to the partnership in the history of the firm. So it wouldn't have been a good move for us to be waiting for someone like us. And if I'd been waiting for the intersection of those two, Right, and uh, it, it could be waiting forever. And so I 
got mentorship from straight white Jewish guys, which there were a lot of at Goldman. And I'm extremely grateful for that whole, you know, Lloyd Blankfein, Harvey Schwartz, Gary Cohn, you get the idea, right? They really, I, I, they, they mentored me, they sponsored me. But one thing I always point out about mentoring and sponsorship, and you, you all have probably been on both sides of this, but you certainly will be, the number of people who message me on LinkedIn and say, would you be my mentor? Uh, can we have coffee? Can we have dinner? I, can, I, can we talk for an hour about your career? I could do this, you know, 100 hours a day and not satisfy the demand. And so one thing that's really, really important and I've always believed in is mentoring has to go both ways. And so the, the mentoring that really, really sticks is when the mentee does something for me. And it's not for me personally, but when someone gets on my counter for mentoring, literally the first thing I'll say is, I'm gonna ask you to pay it forward. I'm gonna ask you to do something. Maybe I'll ask you to organize this event for the network. Who knows what I'm gonna ask you to do, but it's gonna cost you. It's not going to be an asymmetric one-way exchange. Hope that answers your question. Absolutely, thank you so much. You bet. Okay, and that will be our last question for the day. Sorry. Great. Oh, wait. No. He's asking the last one. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, like, like you will you be the last yeah, question. Yeah. You'll be asking the last one. Yeah. I dodged the bullet. <clears throat> Hi, Marty. Doug Hi. Millican. Um, I was a first year MBA student 36 years ago. Um, I'm not from the finance world, by, but I understand Goldman has a very strong and important culture. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the role of culture at Goldman and maybe what you brought or didn't bring to, to Sixth Street? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, Goldman has a distinctive culture, for sure. I, uh, maybe a little known fact, I actually did two tours of duty at Goldman Sachs. The first for four years and then the second for 22. So I left, I got recruited to another firm and the firm's proposition was simple. Do what you did at Goldman and we'll pay you more. And, and basically nearly everybody at Goldman could get that, could get that gig, right? And Goldman would, would be okay with paying less because it didn't have to pay more, right? And why? It was because of the culture. The culture was the difference, right? You were going to get some training, some experience, some connectivity, some membership in an alumni network, and that had a lot of value. So people ask me, well, what, was your, what was your verdict on being CFO of Goldman? And I usually say... Uh, one of two things. The first was it was excellent preparation for something. I still don't know what that something is yet. And then the other thing I would say is the best thing in the world to have been. Right? So it was an amazing uh, experience set, amazing calling card. And there's a lot of quirks about the Goldman culture. Um, here's one. You'll hear this all the time. Did you post so and so? And first, I thought, what is post? Is that like a post it or is it a, the post office, right? No, posting is, is short for did you tell everybody who could possibly have a stake in this decision? Even if you don't really think it's their business and you don't really think they're in your division or in your geography, but they might care, you better have told them. And so how did that manifest itself? I remember people would constantly tell me, when you, you Goldman people come through here, it's crazy. You all say the exact same thing in different words. How do you all stay on message. It's really beautiful, and it's also like the Borg. 
<laughs> right? Like, like you were, everybody's been assimilated. And so if I look at the first part of my Goldman tour of duty and then the second part, there was a great big difference between the two. In the first tour of duty, I spent a lot of time thinking, well, that's not the way we did it in Silicon Valley. I remember arriving at Goldman my first day and thinking, I'm really hungry. Lunchtime has passed. Is there going to be any lunch? Do we get to leave the building? And then I, I finally asked, like, guys, are we going to go to lunch? And they scoffed. What do you mean? I mean, like, leave the building and go have lunch? And I'm like, no, we are not going to do that. We don't ever do that. We're on the trading business. Eat your sandwich with one hand and talk on the phone or type with the other, right? And that was part of the Goldman culture. And I, I, I rebelled against it. I don't want it to be like this. Now, time passed. I grew up. I had an experience at another bank. That experience taught me that the other bank had all the issues of Goldman Sachs, and then it had a million issues that Goldman Sachs did not have. That bank recently failed, and I learned gratitude for what I thought of as the quirks, but came to understand as the essence and the culture of Goldman Sachs. And so when I went back, when I got invited to come back for my second very long tour of duty, I decided... I'm going to be me. The one thing I'm going to do that's countercultural is I'm going to get exercise and sleep every day. And I don't care if I'm the only person in the whole firm that does that because those are my priorities. And for everything else, I am just going to drink the Kool-Aid completely. I am going to live and breathe and bleed Goldman Sachs 24 by 7, and I'm going to see how this goes. And the second time around, it went really, really, really well. And so what I would end on is some amazing advice I received the year I made partner. So uh, a legendary partner, Suzanne, Nora Johnson called all the new baby partners into a room, and she said... I know you are all very concerned about work-life balance. And I'm here to set your minds at ease on the topic by telling you that it doesn't exist so you can stop thinking about it. And I thought, oh, wow, that's, a, that's a harsh. Um, but then she paused and then she said, it doesn't exist, so stop torturing yourself. There is no balance. There is just your life and your short, sacred list of your personal priorities. Know those priorities. Make every choice according to the waterfall of your priorities. Don't expect anyone else, not your spouse, not your family, not your manager, not your colleague, don't expect anybody else to know your priorities or care or help you in any way with them. They are yours. Own them and there will be consequences, and it's okay. And I really took that on board, and so I came up with my short list of my top three sacred priorities, and I don't offer them up as they're the right priorities, but they work for me, and I've been doing it for a while. Um, so they're mine, and yours, yours will vary. So number one priority is my peace of mind. I don't do or say anything that's at odds with my peace of mind, and I do a bunch of things that help my peace of mind. And that can be, for me, sobriety, sleep, jiu-jitsu, there's a bunch of things. Meditation, I do all of that stuff. And it's allowed me to, to get old and still be in this business. And then my number two priority is family. I have two children, and a small, very small number of people who are very close to me, they come second because if, if I'm not peaceful, I'm not helpful to them. I'm actually harmful to them. And then 
my third priority is my career, my work. And nobody better get in the way of that if they come fourth or lower in the list of list of priorities. And I would always tell people, Goldman, they'd be shocked because at Goldman, you're, this is where I was countercultural, which was okay, a little bit. Um, they'd say that Goldman Sachs is your third priority? And I would say, yes, it is third. And if Goldman Sachs is your first priority, I support you. I think that's interesting. I do not want to hang out with you. <laughs> and if it is not on your top three lists of priorities, you are in the wrong company. I would tell thousands of young Goldman people, you're in the wrong place. You should go. We'll be happier. You'll be happier <laughs> somewhere else because this is not that. This is not that kind of place where you can phone it in, and that's a big part of the culture, too. So thanks for asking that. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Marty. On behalf of Dean Harrison and everyone here, really appreciate you coming here and sharing your experiences.